so the the group that's going to be with us um, that volunteer to the students um, are going to come up with some of us from the, from the executive committee of, of the union and we're going to explain why we're here and then we're going to read um, the demands out loud so that um, not only Dr. Kim, of course, and we were hoping the, the board were here, um, but also the I think the, the parents need to know what's happening at this institution, that students want the parents to know as well. So we're going to read the demands out loud. That's great. That's what I was hoping. We are going to read every detail of it. Yeah. Oh. I think we can do it. Yeah, so that, that union guy was, was great because this is going to, this helps not just um, everybody at this institution, but it just helps everyone across this country. Because Your faces are all going to be blurred out, don't worry. I forgot where he's at. I don't know. I don't know. Have fun with us. It's going to suck. I, I need to like make a sign that says yeah. that for the Good camera. Time. Are you guys? I have a mask. Wait, aren't you one of the people that was in that room that that's made the decision the to get rid of our um, most marginalized faculty? Where's our mother? Is this crazy? It's fine. Yeah, she was in that room. She's one of the people that was in the room that made the decision. Oh. <laughs> She's like, I wasn't there. I'm like, yes, you were. Classic. <laughs> There's more space on the other end of the room. Keep, keep coming in. Keep coming in. Oh, no. oh, no. Sorry. Oh, wait, I'm right in the middle. Sorry, guys. Hold on. Sorry. I'll catch up to her. Where is she? Where'd she go? She's back there? Yeah. At least I'm seeing the old chart. It was overheard on the securities intercom that the Kim may be going down to the career center on the third floor, so if we go in there and he's not there, we know where to rush. Yeah. I think we should have people ready on the Yeah, do we want to send some down? I'll go down. down. Good baby on the third floor. Do you want to go down to the Do you know where she is? Oh, Diana? I think she's kind of... I'm too short. She's right there. You know, it's like his first campus appearance since like 1892. <laughs>
had enough. Diana, we are, did you say who you are? My name is Diana Valera, and I'm the president of the faculty union here at Columbia College. Yeah. Did you say who you are? Give her a microphone. at Columbia College Chicago who are represented by a union who this administration has repeatedly over and over decided to have legal maneuvering and tactics to ignore this union, to bypass this union, and then two weeks before the semester began announced, didn't come to the union, didn't notify the union, didn't notify the students, and they were going to remove 350, about approximately 350 classes from classes that were enrolled, classes that were filling, classes that were gonna be um, going, and, and classes that students needed and wanted, most importantly wanted. As part of the directive, this came from the provost who said we need to save $2 million and decided, and this has been a long history of mismanagement on the part of this institution, a long history of mismanagement, and decided that $2 million was gonna come off the backs of those most on the margins, the part-time faculty. And let's remember what happened during COVID. What, remember what happened during COVID and, and what happened to those part-time faculty. And then let's remember what happened to our students. The students come here for one-on-one -on -one small classroom instruction. That's what's advertised. That's one of the reasons why they're here. They come for the faculty. They come from an institution that believes in community building. They come from an institution that's going to promote and help them and secure a job when they leave here. A, a career, not just a job, but a career. And our faculty were appalled when they did this. It harms our, our, our faculty. It disregards those most on the margins. And they kept increasing tuition for our students. But then, but then we saw some of the financials that still won't be released to us. And the financials that were, that we can see, because they're public, what we noticed was that there was a few people at the top who made this decision, by the way. It was not all the stakeholders. It was none of the stakeholders. It was a few people at the top.
everyone else. That's, That's right. What's happening. Yeah. was exposed out of the, and it was not told. None of this was told to us. And while they were having to save everything because there was a financial crisis, not only did we see that those people at the top were increasing their salaries during a pandemic, salaries that are gross, and you can take a look at those salaries, grossly overpaid, then they increased their bonuses. <laughs> A bonus, increase a bonus of over two hundred and forty thousand dollars. Let's, let's be clear: two hundred and forty thousand dollars. That in itself would cover approximately forty-nine of those courses that were canceled for our students. of years of mismanagement. Again, I want to make it clear, this is not just one. This is a con 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 consistently mismanagement on part of this college that has put us in a place that they claim there's a financial crisis. We all know that every time a union goes into bargaining, there's a financial crisis happening at our institution. Yes. So we have come together, we said no more, no more. All of us came together and we said enough is enough. And this time, this is the demands, and we have a deadline of when to meet these demands. And the students came together, and they have self-selected some students that represent the entire college, every single department. <laughs> introduce themselves and then we're going to read the demands there's eight demands here and thank you for your patience they all said they want to make sure prospective parents understand what's happening at this institution yeah! and we can do something about it we love this school yeah! our yeah! students love this school and this is ultimately to make sure we save the integrity of the school. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm gonna pass it to each student. There's about, uh, I think, eight or nine that are gonna um, name which department they're from, and then we're gonna um, do the demands.
to support student success and the academic integrity of programs. <laughs> the group will work directly with the Board of Trustees concerning implementation of the formal recommendations from the group. The purpose of this committee is to review access to facilities and course offerings to ensure academic integrity of the programs and to support student success. My name is Jack Pedro and uh, I'm a film and television major with a concentration in producing. Our uh, third demand is about financial responsibility. Um, a line item budget will be provided to CFAC and students to enable us to creatively and collaboratively address financial health at Columbia College. No bonuses shall be paid out during the 2023 <laughs> until the college is financially stable. There will be no, there will be no cuts. There will be no cuts in wages or class offerings, offerings to CFAC. Should there be a need to make cuts requiring reduced pay for CFAC, such cuts will be across the board, all Columbia wage earners, and calculated in an equitable way and through an equitable distribution, where the highest paid have the greater percentage of er, greater have a greater percentage reduction to pay in pay. Equitable, <laughs> equitable distribution, those paid over two hundred thousand dollars shall have their pay reduced by the largest percentage. There will be lower, there will be multiple lower tiers taking a smaller percentage reduction the lower the wages. Any reduction in Columbia employee pay shall be implemented equitably. Stop using overpaid consultants to tell us what our faculty already yes. know. Yes. Yes. Stop giving bonuses to administrators who are already grossly overpaid. Yes. Stop focusing on advertising and branding. Start focusing on your students. Uh, my name is Go Jean. I'm also a cinema and television major with a focus of producing. Um, the fourth demand is a tuition uh, freeze. So, over the, over the course of years, since freshman year, our tuition has been authorized by 15% or more, yep. which is outrageous. And if you think about it, this is where your money is going. To him, this building, and mismanagement. Yeah. And that's, that's not only your hard-earned money, but it's ours too. My name is Madeline Sawicklow and I represent the photography department. <laughs> stop anti-union efforts. On our CFAC work preservation, stop trying to replace us with other faculty or increase other faculty workload. Stop trying to divide us and honor your commitment to one faculty and restore CFA seats share on shared governance. Yep. <laughs> My name is Samuel. I'm a computer animation major. Yeah. <laughs> um, our sixth on the list is bargain in good faith with CFAC. The, yeah. the administration shall provide basic human rights, a livable wage, health insurance, job security, and negotiate in good faith to resolve any it's ULPs. Let's ULPs. Like yes. That's right. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
student worker. Yes! I have worked, I have worked hand in hand with faculty for years, helping students learn how to direct, how to, you know, try their own productions. And for a film department so big, we're running on broken C stands, broken yes. computers. Yes. I have watched the faculty struggle in a way that they do not deserve. Yes. Right. Yeah. And we've had enough. I know I introduced myself earlier. Um, I just want to say, class sizes increasing for my program would be catastrophic. As it is, as I, as I am also a student worker. I work in the fashion lab. And I am teaching other students because the teachers do not have the time to teach their own students. Yep. Yep. At one point, I actually taught six students at a time how to do pattern making one, a foundational class that you need to understand to succeed in the rest of the program. Yeah. Additionally, too, this administration has failed to help their students when they needed it. I previously lived at the Ark. Um, two weeks ago, a girl was murdered only 100 feet from the door yes, entrance. Yes, yes. Dr. Kim did not send out a college-wide announcement. It took nine hours for us to get any sort of information or to even know what happened. I did not know what happened until two days after from my roommates because it was buried in a slew of other emails. Kim could have easily made a college-wide announcement that wasn't just on email. He could have made a wide release so people are aware. But instead, our safety was at risk. And still, safety has not increased at that door. Yes. Boom! That's yeah. right! And one last thing too, as a disabled student, I already have to spend a lot of time in the shadows working to figure out ways, figure out ways of doing tasks that work for me. A lot of that involves talking with my professors, but if I can't talk to my professors, I would not be able to succeed. And I only have one semester left, but I'm worried about all the other disabled students who are going to come after me, yes. and that's why I'm speaking out. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is James Raven. Uh, I am a sophomore. Um, I am also a student worker. I work for the TRIO group here at school. Um, it's not really widely known. Uh, TRIO is a Congress-funded uh, organization that gives uh, access to the school for disabled students, first-generation students, and low-income students. As somebody who is all three of those things, I am furious. I'm livid. Yeah. Because those are the people that this school is made for. With a 95% acceptance rate, only 40% will graduate in a four-year span. Boo! That means with the cutting of classes, we will be stuck here longer, meaning that we will not graduate in the four-year path, which means we will spend more money, which yep. means they will get paid more. Boo! We need to stand up for our minority students. Columbia, 
I searched out for when I was in high school. This is not the Columbia that I started at, and this is not the Columbia I want to attend yes. to be at. Yeah. On top of that, I am a transfer, so I had to leave an institution to come to this one. That was hard enough. I don't want to do it again. Yep. And I'm a student yeah. I am a student and call ambassador that are calling students, calling so many people that are interested in the Columbia that is advertised, not the Columbia that is trying to be changed. Yep. You pride yourself on part-time faculty working professionals. That's why I came here. For the small classes, that's why I came here. I cannot function in a big class. I cannot function without having active professionals that are teaching my classes. You get rid of them, you get rid of the class size, you do not have the Columbia you are advertising. My name is Jonathan Webster. I am a part of the theater tech and design program of the I am a transfer student, I am a student worker, and I just want to be fucking proud of where I go. Hello, my name is Emily M. Johnson, and I am an acting major with a minor in voiceover. Voiceover as a profession in itself is already grossly underpaid. Yep. And to see these working professionals already dealing with the shit they have to go through in their industry, dealing with the shit they do at they do dealing with the shit here at Columbia, it angers me so much. And not just and not just the voiceover teachers, all the part-time faculty. I have felt more supported, more, I've been taught so much more in my, in my two years here at Columbia, one and a half technically, my one and a half years at, here at Columbia, than I have ever had in my entire fucking life. And to see all these wonderful, wonderful part-time faculty members that this institution is built upon be treated like garbage? That angers me directly to my core, and this is not the Colombian that I thought I was signing up for. Yourself to everyone. I was just wondering if you could introduce yourself, you in the in the suit. Here. Yeah. Hi, my name is Laurent Perno. I'm the chief of staff in the office of the president. Oh my God. Okay. Oh. 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 What were you doing on your phone? Oh. I was taking notes as to the demand, so we remember when we met about it later. We oh. can give you the demand. Hi, my name is Nora Logan. I am an acting major here at Columbia. Something that I heard yesterday at our real town hall meeting that scared me to my core was the talk of losing our accreditation. Yes. yes. Now, this talk came up, it was brief, but it scared me still. It's a talk of accreditation. Dr. Kim allegedly said, who cares if we lose it? This means that our degrees that we are all paying for and working for are not degrees. They are pieces of paper. So when we try and go into the industry that we have now spent hundreds of thousands of dollars here to get access to, we won't have access to it. with my everything here if I took any action. 
Every day I'm harassed by my manager saying that I should shut up about all of this. And all my There's one thing that I, and we are very careful to make sure that everything that is said here is accurate. And there's one thing that was said that I want to clarify. When I stood in this room and you were speaking, Dr. Kim, you were describing and talking about um, the Board of Trustees and you posed a question about accreditation. And so that's very different and I want to clarify that. That's okay. I mean, I just want to make sure we clarify anything like that. Um, but he did say that he didn't, didn't think that we should know where the money was going. He did that say, was he did, it, I could, cannot get a response and it's in writing, and I forgot what, exactly what that writing was. It's not relevant for us to know as a union where the money is going. That's the response I got in writing. I'm sure you have a copy of that. Mm -hmm. So all of this is unacceptable. And what you're seeing and hearing is a, a um, a climate of fear for some. There's some in this institution that are terrified. Yep. And you created that climate. Your administration has created that climate. We're not afraid. We are not afraid to stand up. We're clearly not afraid to speak up. We have to speak up. And why are we doing this? It's because we have to make sure that our students are getting the quality of education. We have to make sure the part-time faculty who are the backbone of this institution are treated fairly and equitably. And this is difficult because, of course, we were approached and said, you don't want to disrupt this. You don't want to disrupt this day. We have, we, have, we have to disrupt this. We have to make sure that everyone understands what's going on at this institution. And our goal is to save it and have a Columbia that we're proud of and that we recommend our students to come to and no more false advertising. Yeah. So stay tuned. These demands will be delivered to the Board of Trustees and they have to be met by this Wednesday at noon. We are not gonna wait any longer. We are not gonna allow you to divide us. We will not allow anybody in this room to be retaliated against. We will not allow it. Yep. If there's any more students that want to speak up, otherwise, um, I, I don't know if anybody would like to ask us questions. We are so happy to answer questions. I want to hear the audience. I just want to say thank you to the Student Center staff for letting us in because yes. there were some. <laughs>
Be respectful. I'm with you, friends. I am with you. 100%. I am with you, but I want you to do it respectfully. That was weird. I'd, I'd like to know what uh, Columbia College's fund balance equity is. And uh, can you please state your name? Dominic Perone. Okay, cool. Thank you, Dominic. Thank you, Dominic. Would you like to respond? Dr. Kim? First of all, I want to say thank you to all the students. Um, you, you brought up a lot of things that are hard to hear. What about the union? But wait a minute. But, oh. but it's important to recognize that you're in an institution that values every voice. So, that's all right. Um, and we are in active negotiations with the union, and it's our intention to keep a fair dialogue going. Um, I, you know, I've heard a lot of what you're saying. I have to say, and again, in the same way that you have opinions, I have opinions too. I don't think that everything you're saying is, is actually based on a full knowledge of what's going on at the college, but that's okay. It's all right. Now, coming back to your question, sir, I don't really, I'm not sure what the I don't know what that means, so maybe you can elaborate a little bit more and I can try to answer it for you. Um, did you say that uh, Columbia College was needing to dip into uh, accrued funds in order to make up the difference in the budget? So the college had, up till now, about 80 to 90 million dollars in a reserve fund, and after this year that fund will be exhausted because of our continuing deficit. Because of your bonuses. You we also have an endowment. But the challenge with dipping, well, first of all, it's a, it's a sign of a very weak financial situation to start dipping. We already take 5% every year from the endowment. So that's part of our operating budget. Um, at, after this year, unless we continuously reduce our deficit spending, we'll have to start taking more than that from the deficit. And the challenge with that is as the endowment shrinks, it's less able to fund the ongoing operations of the institution. That's how numbers work, yeah. Say it again, sir. Um, what, what, how much is the endowment? The endowment currently is around 200 million. So let me, let me answer this since it's coming up as a question. So there's two things. I have, presidents in their contracts have different forms of income, and one piece is called deferred compensation, which is basically a, a tool that boards use to encourage presidents to stay. And so the 200, it's actually the correct number is $250,000 was part of the deferred compensation agreement that's in my contract. That's not a bonus, that's part of my contract. And the other bonuses that you're talking about, there was one year, uh, which would have been 2021, when? I will finish if you would let me, thank you. Um, so, the, uh, the board of directors felt that we at Columbia had done a particularly strong job of managing the college during the pandemic, particularly in comparison to other institutions. And as a result, they approved a series one-time bonuses for members of the administration. That's what that is. So that's the that's the answer to the question. That's the answer to the question. Other things are fine, but um, so let me ask our students a question: Are do you want me to have an opportunity to finish speaking to the families here, or do you want to not have that happen this morning? No! And the other question I have for you is, um, it looks like this is a group primarily of students, is that correct? Yes. Okay. All right, well, say it again. Great, thank you. Uh, happy to try to set up some chance for us to talk and- Right here, right here. Well, this, this is about to be over. Uh, no, 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 this session is about to be over. Happy to talk, but, um, the, the reality is, just so you all know, whether it's trickling down to you as students in a way that's effective, which, which if it isn't, I'm very sorry to hear. Did you just say trickling what we're down? Trying to do, what we're trying to do is 
within very constrained financial circumstances, make sure that you are getting quality education and graduating. And, and it's important to remember that there's a difference sometimes between the things that you want and the things that the faculty feel you must get in order to have the, the true worth of your education. So I'm just, you know, think about that for a second. You don't have to accept it, you don't have to like it. Uh, where, where are we with time on our session? We have time. We have a lot of time. You have time, but our families have a schedule today. Diana, 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 Diana. We've reached this point not to speak with you, Dr. Kim, at this point. We are going to be speaking to the Board of Trustees. Okay. I, will, I will make sure that the Board receives that list of eight demands. We'll make sure that the Board receives that list. part-time faculty, which is the backbone of this institution, after what happened during COVID is shameful, Dr. Kim. It's shameful. I hear you concerned, Diana. I hear you concerned. I, I, don't, I don't think that there's any targeting going on, but... Uh, let's deal with how many there are. So let's deal with the facts. The facts are that you did not come to the union Two weeks prior to the semester, we were in bargaining talks. For those of you that understand bargaining, you have an obligation to come to the union. You implemented, through the provost, unilateral changes that have direct consequences to mandatory subjects to bargain. For us, that is wages, that was an increase in class size. It directly harms quality of education, it harms our students, and it was the directive stated the directive was, two weeks before the semester began, get rid of 300 and something courses, courses that students want, students, students need, and only target the most marginalized of faculty, the part-time faculty, while they're in bargaining talks. This is what happened. We had to file unfair labor practice. You are hiring attorneys. You keep hiring attorneys. You have attorneys in-house now that sit at the bargaining table instead of you, instead of anyone else there, instead of the provost there, who now are, you're paying, the student's tuition is paying to fight the union instead of working with us. Those are the facts. That's what's going on. Oh. Statements. I don't agree with all of them, but that's 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 our prerogative, right? I think um, we are. We, the fact is, we are in negotiation, right? We are. We're having an ongoing bargaining. It's a little stuck right now. There's no lack. There's no lack of respect for the role that part-time faculty play at this institution. I'm the president that came in and talked about our faculty being one faculty. I still feel that way, but. The underlying financial reality is that different classes of faculty have different relationships to the institution. We're trying to make this work for the long-term future of the institution. That's what's going on. So show us the finances. So let's be clear. This institution was founded on working professionals. You just heard the students say this is why they're coming to this institution. We make up the majority of the faculty. We were founded on 100% part-time faculty. Institutions across this country, and Columbia is not alone in this, but they certainly are participating in classifying us as part-time faculty. This is a way for them to not have to give us health insurance, or at least try not to give us health insurance, and they do not. We make $5,100 for a class. That is not a living wage on, a, on an average. That's how much faculty make. We were here through the pandemic. We thought we learned as an educational institution that those that are most on the margins were most harmed. And we absolutely know this to be true, especially those of us in faculty who are economically harmed at, in, at this institution. The black and brown communities were harmed during the pandemic. How is this an equitable commitment, equitable distribution to dealing with any kind of financial funds when you're targeting, and it is targeting, you only are targeting the part-time faculty. 
those that are most on the margins. How is that an equitable distribution? I was asked at bargaining, well, how else can we do $2 million? And I, I absolutely responded with, stop giving anyone bonuses, any bonuses, and you distribute the money equitably. It's an investment, and we're all in this together. You don't disregard and throw out and basically fire the part-time faculty, and that's the message you're giving. These are alumni from, from Columbia. Alumni from Columbia that you're saying are discardable, that aren't treated well, and because you decided to classify them in a way that you think they don't have a voice at this institution. First of all, I didn't decide anything, Diana. You're here much longer than me. Um, this is why we're in, that's the role of negotiation at the bargaining table, right? This is not a bargaining session. We're not bargaining. So I know. You've so been bargaining for five I heard. Months. I heard. That's right. And we'll keep bargaining until we can come to an equitable, fair agreement. Are you going to talk so, wait, 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 wait. So, when you get rid of a third of the assets, I think you should go in. This session for our families was scheduled to go to 1045. So, wait a minute, let's have some respect for our guests. Because you have to remember, a lot of our families have come in from out of town. Clearly, this morning was somewhat different than what they expected, but that's all right. It's important, I think, for our families to see this is a school that is open to conversation, discussion, dialogue, disagreement. Um, and
comments. I, I do want to say one thing, and Dr. Kim, it is dismissive. When you make certain comments and you acknowledge the students, and of course it was an under, underway saying, where's the faculty? And you know what? You know very well that part-time faculty are afraid of this institution. You've created that climate of fear. They are coming out strong. They will be voting. We are voting on strike currently. And, and they voted to have me and other leaders that are here and there are part-time faculty to stand up and be the voice to speak to you. And that's why I'm here. So don't dismiss the 600 and something part-time faculty that I represent. So thank you everyone. I think that this session is over. And as well as the director of curriculum. And I know the decisions made for course offerings is generally done in the spring time frame. At what point and how did um, the decision be made to cut 340 courses? Yes. I don't have to do a microphone. Don't give me that example. But we all, every, every fall semester, just before we start the class schedule, we look at enrollment figures within sections. So every year, we start the year by reducing the overall load of classes based on who's enrolled in what. Uh, we also it's open up high. sections when there's a need for them. Uh, the primary factor is maintaining a certain course load level and also looking at students' uh, graduation plans and making sure that if there are courses that have to be offered so that students can take them in the right sequence that are offered. I'm not directly involved in that work that happens in academic affairs, but that's the process. Uh, this year, I think we were more rigorous about looking at those numbers because of our financial situation. I think in the past, we've been a little bit more lax about running courses that were under-enrolled. This year, I think we stuck more to our own guidelines, which is why the number is higher than it's been. What about the classes that were fully enrolled that you canceled? That I don't know anything about. Like, you don't know anything about that? Dr. Kim, and I want to be honest to I want to be honest to everyone here, and we we, they, we owe it to them. There was a directive that came out of the provost office, and to answer the question, it was my understanding it was decided on by six or seven people, nobody else, no stakeholders, no faculty, no input from anyone, and those people who are making top salaries at this institution decided to keep their salaries, make sure to keep their bonuses, make sure to keep your bonus, your salary. And what they decided was 350 something, I don't have the exact number, but approximately that, two weeks, two weeks before the semester began. I, the exact date, I believe, was August 11th. Two weeks. And two weeks before the semester began, didn't come to the union, by the way. There is an obligation, I think you know that. And, um, and decided to just go ahead and implement this. And the decision, was to increase class size because there was a demand for these classes. Let's be clear, it wasn't the regular like you're describing. There's a demand for these classes, but it was a cost-saving measure to save $2 million over this academic year on the backs of part-time faculty, students, because the quality of education, they're coming here for those one-on-one um, -on -one instruction. The directive is to try to increase class size everywhere. Sometimes class sizes that increased double, triple in size. What's happening in curriculum at our institution, and I would love to show you and talk to you about it, it's horrible. Decisions are being made, they're just top-down decisions. It's not faculty that are making these decisions. Everyone here is being told we have this directive and we have to increase class size. Every department is going through this. 
And so the incoming students are going to see class sizes double in size. You have to advertise and make it honest to everyone with what their students are going into. Why wasn't there more transparency with the parents of these students and I'm looking for transparency. I'm looking for communication yes, yes. for the parents. I'm a, a mother of an incoming freshman. And I was sold and enthusiastic on everything Columbia has to offer. And today is the first tone and information I'm having of this unjust situation and this challenge that is being presented between faculty, teachers, union, and students. Where is the transparency, sir? Yeah. Good morning. Um, I am Marcella David, Senior Vice President and Provost, and I just wanted to explain what the planning was. Um, this summer, we had an additional um, challenge with our budget, and as is the case for all of the educational institutions, we need to try and make sure that we are able to provide what we have to provide within the budget that is available. Excuse me. So let me uh, let me continue. What was the challenge? The challenge was that we have a certain range of number of students we believe in our planning are going to enroll in our college. We have an expectation based on the mix of students and the scholarship assistance that we're providing to allow students to come. And that is our tuition revenue, which is the bulk of what we have in order to spend. When it turned out that our expectations were not what we had hoped in terms of our revenue, in August, I was asked to help narrow the, the gap I did not actually ask anyone to remove, and nor were there 300 courses removed from the fall semester. I asked, excuse me, I, excuse me let, me, let me finish, because the way that it was presented was to suggest that we eliminated classes that were already being enrolled and that the students were therefore foreclosed from classes where they were already enrolled. As the, as the president noted, every year, every semester before the semester starts, we remove classes where there is less enrollment than the full enrollment that's expected for running a class, and that happened. And in addition, I asked our faculty to think about the spring schedule and to, in their planning for the spring schedule, try and accomplish a few things. One thing that I've asked them to accomplish is to think about sections where there may be an opportunity to make a section larger in a multi-section class so that we could run one or two or three or four fewer sections in a multi-section class. I have also asked them to think about when we have, in particular, electives, when whether or not they're able to sequence an elective so that an elective might be offered one semester as opposed to another semester, um, so that we can manage to narrow that gap in terms of what it is that we are able to afford and what it is that we're going to be able to deliver. In so doing, I explain the budget reality to our chairs, who are the leaders of our various departments, and I ask them to work with their faculty in order to make decisions that would be based on three main ideas. One is, 
how do we find efficiencies? The second is, how do we make sure that we are providing the learning outcomes that we are always wanting to make sure that we are and, uh, providing for our students? And the third is, how do we make sure that we're offering the courses that our students need in order to progress for graduation? And I gave that directive to the faculty, and the faculty has been working to make decisions. Right now, it looks like they have trimmed from the spring schedule. Um, I'd like to say. I, I'm, I'm actually not finished, and you all spoke, so let me finish. Let me finish. We actually are planning, the spring schedule has not yet been. As a, as a student, let me, that was Fox. Let me finish. That was Fox. No, that was Fox. That was Fox. Let me finish. Let this is what they try to do to finish. us. Let just me saying. finish. You can respond, but first, I'm going to finish. You're just saying the same thing over and over again. So, right now, uh, last spring, we scheduled about 1,900 classes, of which 1,700 ran. This spring, we are actually scheduling around 1,700 classes. So we are about going to run right now, assuming everything runs with the same um, level of fullness. We're about to run about the same number of classes that we scheduled um, last year. So that is what I can tell you about what it is that we did with our planning. Again, they all respond to yeah, <laughs> I just respectfully, that response to the question was below par. So, as a so, as you guys all know in this room, Columbia College Chicago Film Department makes up the majority of the student yes. body here, right? I've been here long enough where I've been able to take classes that some of them are not offered anymore, which are required for us to graduate, right? But the faculty here are fighting for our classes. So last year, I took the live producer workshop, which partners with Directing Three and other classes, right? This year, Directing Three was cut, even though you're saying that you told the faculty to like cut classes that don't make sense or you know that enough students wouldn't want to take it. There are so many students that I know that wish that Directing 3 was still class offered. Or practical! Not only does it not teach us how to do our job that we want to pursue, but also the faculty are fighting for classes that we need and that we love. So this talk of a that the faculty are deciding that we're cutting classes because they don't think it's important, I just respectfully think that's not true. Because last year and this year, there's so many teachers that I have that are fighting to put classes back onto the schedule. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yes, I came here to um, direct. I was trying to get into the directing sequence, and I I was supposed to graduate in 2026. I just found out that if I if I manage to get into the D1 class, which is there's I believe there's three four sections that are already full, and if I get into that class, I still won't complete the sequence until 2028. I, I was supposed to find out about this somewhere last year, but I mean, my advisor was fired, so. <laughs> Mine too! I have three yeah. advisors and I'm only a junior. Yeah. Same! And these classes, it's not like us students don't want to take them. They're filling up. Yes. Each year, yes. when we go to um, sign up for classes, the website crashes, Every year. and we have, to, we have to figure out a new way to build the schedule, and I think this is probably the correct way of saying it, but it's like 
drafting your own fantasy class team. You know, you don't know what's going to happen. There's always a first round, you know, at 7 a.m. You don't get that, so you have to move on to the next. And because of that, they say that each year, oh, it gets easier and easier. I've never gotten a class schedule I needed. Right. Yeah. And they say each year it's going to get easier and easier as you go through. It does not. It crashes. We have to email teachers to get into the full classes. And luckily, the faculty understands us and allows us to be in those classes that we need to take to graduate. Well, you can see this is not just something that happened overnight. This is a long, long years of um, this administration, and frankly, it is mismanagement, and we can show over and over the type of decisions. But this decision, let me be really clear, it did come two weeks before the semester, approximately two weeks before the semester began. It was decided upon by a few people at the top. There were no faculty representation. No <laughs> faculty representation. And let's talk about dismissive language, because when the provost keeps saying, and let me be clear too, that the, the outcome of this after the fact, after the decision was made, is trying to put the blame now on faculty. Why? Because they want us to fight each other. We're not gonna do that. All our faculty care about this of faculty. She is not speaking of myself or the majority of the part-time faculty. She ignores us, she dismisses us, she won't even acknowledge us as representatives of this institution. And I have come to you over and over, Dr. Kim, and yeah. said that's a problem. That's a big problem. And so when I want to be clear, when the provost said, I'm going to the faculty, first of all, there's two things with that. One, we are not going to allow her to divide us among each other. The faculty did not make this decision. This came from a few people at the top. And let me also be clear, the provost is not recognizing the union or the majority of the faculty. The harm to this institution is great. The harm to the classes, the, the only people that are going to be harmed by this per the directive is part-time faculty. Part-time faculty, that's it. And that was a response to us. Part-time faculty only are gonna be harmed by this. It is not a commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion that the college claims to have. It is not a role model for our students who are gonna go out and many of them be in jobs like SAG-AFTRA, be in jobs that are unionized. And, and we're a proud Chicago union town. of our brothers and unions across this country that are fighting for this type of inequity. We have to do that. And, and I'm proud of all the students here. I'm proud of our faculty for standing up. It is not easy. It is not easy because this institution during COVID and always tries to, and fights tooth and nail to make sure we don't get unemployment. This is the type of institution we live under. This is it. And so we also are with um, CTU. This is our union. We know how to fight these kind of battles. It is not okay. It's not okay to do this, Dr. Yeah. Kim. Yeah. Not over and over. You asked us to wait. It's been years of mismanagement. And when you do these kind of decisions and you dismiss the entire part-time faculty, and I have to sit here and listen to now, I'm gonna place the blame on the other faculty yeah. to try to divide us, it's not gonna happen. It's not gonna happen. Okay. And to not acknowledge the part-time faculty when you say like faculty is not okay. <laughs> It's not okay, and it has happened over and over and over. We were not involved, we are not involved, and we're still not involved in these decisions. We have so, to carry Curriculum decisions are managed by the faculty. This is not an effort to try and divide, and the, divide faculty. the faculty. Divide the faculty. It includes full-time faculty who are tenured, our teaching track faculty, and part-time faculty and who are 
full-time faculty and I'm sorry, what percent? Part-time faculty make over 60% of this institution. And, and part-time faculty are able to participate in faculty meetings of departments where decisions are being made. It's not, it's not true. And this institution has denied us. We were part of shared governance, Dr. Kim, and you have denied us access to shared governance. And if you want to give us shared governance, that's great because it's been denied over and over and over. Diana, you are, you saying, are you saying that part-time faculty are not able to attend? I'm a parent. Are you saying that they are not able to attend? Yes, I'm a parent. Hold on. There's, there is a there is over here who would like to here, speak. I've been a okay. photographer. I, I have a question. I'm obviously a parent, okay. and I'm also a public school educator. I'm a union Woo! member. Woo! And First of all, I'm really disturbed by the lack of transparency with yes. financial information. Yes. As a parent and as someone who works on a site-based de decision-making council in my own school, you, you can't hide financials. That has got to be public knowledge. Yep. Uh, yes. But my question is, for those of us parents who uh, have been enlightened, thanks to you all coming in today, so thank you for that. with our opinions or our questions and where can we find their contact information? So I'm gonna give you an email for the union and we're happy to connect you with um, the larger coalition. So the email for the union is info, I-N-F-O, at um, P, at P as in Paul, F as in Frank, A, C as in Charlie, .org.org.org.org.org. <laughs> um, um, we are so happy to meet with you, talk to you, show you the facts, show you the emails, show you the evidence of how these decisions were made. I will, I will, I will expose everything. We will show you every little detail. <laughs> I think we have another question by yeah, a parent. Before that, um, Office of the President, one word, Office of the President at colum.edu, C O U C O L U M.edu, sorry about that, um, is a way to get in touch with our office for any, any student parent. Uh, we plan on continuing to uh, communicate with the community. We heard a lot of the parents' questions and some of the students' questions today. Uh, we'll work on, on, on providing further information on that, but Office of the President at Colum.edu is a way to get in touch with the administration. Uh, let's, let's hear another response from the audience. Uh, I'm a parent, sophomore. Um, been a photographer for over a half a century. Uh, so I understand the arts, I understand the economics, I have lived it for years. The conversation is becoming a little tedious right now. I want you to understand that my one fear is how to really understand and, and, and believe in the administration position when alumni who are told that they can go out into the uh, world and have a career give back to the institution that they learn from only to find out that they don't get full benefits, only to find out that they have to struggle, and then to find out that they're going to be fine. This is something that diminishes your argument when you do not stand in solidarity with the people who you are educating, sending out into the world, then you cut them off. How can we trust in your thought process as to what is essential for education. Now, I understand economics. I am not greatly successful in my career because I wasn't the greatest businessman. But I do understand art, and I do understand the, con the, the decisions that you make. But then again, you're undermining the position by cutting the throat of the people who are your family. I want you to know, as a longtime photographer, 
that Columbia views areas like theater and photography just don't make us money. Yep. And so yeah, they, 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 they closed the dark room! So, um, again, I'm, I'm Laurent. Um, the office uh, of the president email address is a way to get in touch with us and for us to get back to you. As you know, there are, as you know, there are a lot of other events planned for the weekend, some of which are a demand on the president's time that he has to get to. Uh, we know this needs to be an ongoing conversation as a community, and we're uh, committed to keep keeping that conversation going. Those thoughts from the audience. We unfortunately have to end this event right now. We have, we have, uh, we have a way to reach us. The audience. We have another response from the audience. Thank you. I would like to know. We brought our son here. He is a BFA cinematography student. loves it here. About the time you cashed my check, you decided to cut classes and increase the size of the classes. It is a stretch for us to afford our child to come here. And we chose Columbia because we thought it would get him the best opportunity to pursue his passion and make a life of it. Yeah. 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 And he's not going to be able to do that with increasing class sizes and classes being yep. cut. Woo. And so do we sign a lease for next year? <laughs> no. Or do we plan B? Plan B. Because this is not what we signed up for. Yes! And again, for the parents, for the parents, for full transparency to address class size, which the faculty, I don't know any faculty that are thinking this is a good idea for this institution, which by the way advertises small class sizes, one on one instruction. That's why many of our students come here. But we have been arguing over and over, besides the economic issues, besides all the issues of lack of transparency that you're hearing, we cannot give our students the quality of education in those large class sizes. We know it. We know that some of the, the courses that are being eliminated are because they, they can't get any larger. So eliminate some of those courses is what we're told. Unfortunately, one thing that the faculty, I mean, fortunately, the faculty are pointing out a few things. When the class sizes get that large, first of all, it's unethical to take the money. It's unethical. We can't give the kind of quality of education. And if you don't have that one-on-one -on -one instruction, you don't build that community. You don't build those relationships. You can't help those students then get the careers that they deserve. You can't possibly teach them. So what are we told to teach them the quality of education that we know that we know the students deserve. So what are we told? And recently we're told, what do we do about this? The college comes to us and says, we have a plan. And the plan is we're gonna train you to manage your larger class size. And yes, that may mean you may have to change your curriculum. You may have to think differently on how you teach your courses. This is unacceptable. It's unacceptable for many reasons because we care and we value our students and we as faculty know that they're not going to get the quality of instruction. It's a mental health issue. There's so many issues that happen if we can't have that one-on-one -on -one instruction. It's unethical. It's unethical because of where the money is going, Dr. Kim. It's, you've got to open up your books. It's way too late for conversations. That's why these demands are here. That's why we're moving forward. <laughs> Okay, thank you everybody. Uh, please stay in touch, please communicate. Uh, there will be staff available throughout the day. Um, and thank you. I've got a question for any administration that is here. My name is Petey. I am a freshman traditional animation major and acting and theater directing minors. I want to know why was the first thought to cut required classes in to save this two million dollars instead of lowering your own extremely large salaries Whoa. to save that money instead.
One more thing. Each of you has a different experience, which I respect. Um, I don't know the policy of cutting required courses. I do oh, know. Why do you not know anything? You're the president. You're the president. You can't just use I don't know as an excuse. He's uh, the CEO. Sometimes there are classes that are desired, that are not required. That, would, that could be what's <coughs> going on in some cases. Um, the other thing I want to say about class size, there's a very thoughtful conversation going on about where is it possible and where is it not possible. Conversation with who? Faculty? No. Um, so, so particularly, we're looking at ways in which to preserve the upper levels where most of the true hands-on, closer to one-on-one -on -one work goes on in the curriculum expanding at the, at the beginning, but we're also aware that that creates challenges that we're trying to figure out how to ameliorate. Um, well, it works then for the low retention rate. That's if, right. If none of this, the classes get smaller as they go. Hmm? If we had endless resources, we'd be having a very different conversation. So the student center was built by selling our share of the University Center and the Johnson Building. This was not built with tuition money. And, well, I have my next presentation that I have to get to. You see, when we see the look in your eyes and we see you trying to be a politician and avoid questions, don't think we're stupid. Diana Valera and myself will make sure that the Board of Trustees gets what this demand. You might be able to fool some of these kids with weird parents who get brainwashed all the time by people like you, but you can't fool us.